The colonial conflicts that started with the Age of Discovery in the late 15th century often pitted unlikely foes against each other. In the 16th century, the Ottoman and the burgeoning Portuguese naval empires clashed across the Indian Ocean and Africa in a series of direct and proxy conflicts in order to gain colonial dominance. In this video, we will try to depict the most famous episodes of this long and complicated conflict. These long videos are extremely time-consuming and difficult to make, so consider liking, commenting, and sharing. The sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV, is the favorite documentary platform of kings and generals. We've been enjoying our Magellan TV subscription and hope that our viewers love it too. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries, among them hundreds of historical documentaries. If you want to learn more about the Ottomans, you have to check out the Ottomans vs. Christians The Battle for Europe documentary series. Magellan TV also has perfect travel documentaries, and we recommend watching Portugal, Linhares Castle to Lisbon, if you want to see this beautiful country. You can watch both anytime, anywhere, on your television, laptop or mobile device, and it's compatible with most devices. Our viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. This gives you an entire year for less than $3.50 a month. Every documentary we've watched has been worth double that, and there are now 3,000 in the Magellan TV collection. This offer is available to returning users too. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. Support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. Start your free trial today. Since Vasco da Gama first reached India after a circumnavigation of Africa in 1498, the reach and power of the Portuguese had been growing rapidly in the Indian Ocean. In 1500, the same Portuguese armada that had made first landfall in Brazil continued on to India, bombarding Calicut and establishing Portugal's first Asian factory in Cochin. By 1504, Portuguese ships were regularly plundering Arab shipping in the Indian Ocean, with a blockade of the Red Sea earning them the ire of the Mamluk Sultanate and of their trading partner Venice. Seeing that it couldn't oppose the Portuguese on its own, Calicut's ruler, the Zamorin, sent envoys to the Mamluks in 1504. The Mamluks were the strongest empire in the Indian Ocean at the time. But its military was mostly made of elite cavalry, while the navy was often neglected. The small ships, called dows, used by the Mamluks, were inferior to the Portuguese vessels, as they could only carry light guns. So the ruler of Egypt, Kansa al Ghori, sent his own envoys to the Doge of Venice, Leonardo Loredan, who agreed to help against Portugal. Another power to join the alliance was the Sultanate of Gujarat, ruled by Mahmud Shah I, which also reeled from the Portuguese piracy. Venetian carracks and galleys, which were mainly used in the Mediterranean, sailed to Alexandria, where they were disassembled. From here, the ship parts were sent to Suez by land and assembled again. Led by Emir Hussein Kurdi, the fleet left the city in November of 1505. Along the way, the Mamluks spent time fortifying the cities in western and southern Arabia against a possible Portuguese attack, as well as recruiting mercenaries in Arabia and Nubia. So despite the fact that the travel time to India usually took less than two months, the fleet arrived in Dieu only in September of 1507, where they were joined by the Gujarati navy led by Malik Ayaz. Despite all of the attempts of the Allies, they weren't able to convince other states in western India to join their cause. The fleet was significantly smaller and weaker than the Mamluks and their Venetian allies had originally planned, and only had six carracks and six galleys, which were joined by 30 smaller Gujarati galleys and four great carracks under the command of Dieu's governor Malik Ayaz, with a largely mercenary force of over 4,000 crewing them. Further reinforcement came in the form of dozens of small boats from Calicut, their gunwales reinforced with cotton bales to strengthen them against Portuguese cannon fire. In terms of manpower, the combined Muslim fleet 
carried over 5,000 soldiers, sailors and oarsmen, notably including 450 elite Mamluks. The Portuguese fleet opposing them, under the command of Jalmeida, consisted of 16 ships and 1,200 men, leaving the Portuguese rather outnumbered. The size of the Portuguese ships would give a significant advantage to Almeida during the coming battle, as would the formidable array of cannons each could bring to bear. But possibly the greatest advantage the Portuguese would have was the naval inexperience of Emir Hussein and the Mamluks, and the inconsistency of Malik Ayaz in his dealings with his allies. As the battle was being fought over his own city, Ayaz had more to lose than Hussein or the Zamorin of Calicut, and so seems to have tried to hedge his bets by making several overtures to the Portuguese, unknown to the Mamluks, following the Mamluk Gujarati victory in the Battle of Chol in 1508. It is possible that some of the disarray the Allied fleet was in upon Almeida's February 1509 attack can be attributed to Ayaz committing less than fully to the defence, perhaps even having struck a secret deal with Almeida beforehand. But given the rage Almeida had been in since his son's death at Chol, it is entirely possible that Ayaz was rebuffed and that the shocking boldness of Almeida's frontal assault on the Diu harbour simply caught the Mamluks little experienced in naval warfare, off guard, despite advanced warning from Calicut of Almeida's approach. Almeida's fleet approached Diu from the east, sailing at all speed towards the well-defended harbour. As battle was first joined at 11 on February 3rd, the Mamluk fleet and the bulk of the Gujaratis remained at anchor in Diu's harbour, under the protection of its shore batteries, while the smaller oared vessels both some Gujarati light galleys and the fleets from Calicut, ill-suited for the exchange of gunfire that was to begin the battle, had positioned themselves in the Diu Channel to the west of the harbour, intending to fall on the Portuguese fleet from behind once the boarding started. As Diu's shore guns would leave Almeida at a disadvantage in a long-range firefight, while a close-quarters battle of grapples and boarding actions would favour the numerically superior Muslim fleet, Almeida might have seemed to be sailing into a trap. Nevertheless, he wasted no time in closing to grappling range, with only one short exchange of fire between the two fleets occurring, before the Portuguese vessels sailed boldly into Diu Harbour. The superior gunnery of the Portuguese was put to full use, sinking one of the 12 Mamluk ships nearly immediately, while the Gujarati shore gunners soon found themselves unable to safely fire into the tightly packed melee of ships. On the decks of the grappling ships, the heavily armoured Portuguese soldiers were more than holding their own against their more numerous opponents, and though the well-trained Mamluks fought bravely and fiercely, Many of the mercenaries in the diverse Gujarati force lost their morale and abandoned their ships and posts under the noisy barrage of the Portuguese matchlocks. These early firearms proved more useful as a psychological weapon than for their killing power, however, with volleys of arrows from the decks and crow's nests of the Muslim fleet taking a toll of their own on the Portuguese. Hussein's flagship was boarded early in the battle with the fight eventually involving two ships from each side as reinforcements, turning the tide in one direction or the other, but the decision of the Muslims to remain in harbour had granted the initiative and mobility advantages to the Portuguese, who quickly found themselves with the upper hand. This mobility advantage would prove the decisive factor, as despite their advantages, the Portuguese were still gravely outnumbered. Had the large fleet in the Western Channel been able to join the Malay unopposed, as Hussein had planned, Almeida's fleet would likely have found itself trapped, surrounded and overwhelmed in short order. But Almeida himself, in his flagship Flor du Mar, did not join the Malay, instead continuing quickly westward past the harbour battle with two other ships to cut off the lightly armed oared vessels in the Channel. Hussein's decision to split his fleet was rapidly proving disastrous. As he had kept all of the ships with heavy cannons in harbour in preparation for a firefight that never came, 
The fleet in the Channel was all but helpless against Almeida's flagship, despite the overwhelming difference in numbers. All of Hussein's ships that might have been able to engage Flor du Mar and immobilize or board it had been pinned down in the harbour, unable to intervene in the unfolding debacle. By giving up the initiative to Almeida and allowing the Portuguese to choose their engagements, Hussein had allowed a significant portion of his forces to be neutralized by a small Portuguese task force. Over the course of the battle, Flor du Mar fired more than 600 cannon shots into the tightly packed vessels in the channel, sinking many before powder began to run low. In the harbor, with their reinforcements cut off, the Gujarati and Mamluk forces soon began to break against the well-armored and well-trained Portuguese soldiers. As dusk approached, nearly all of the ships in the harbor had been pacified, their crews either leaping into the sea to swim for shore, perishing in battle, or surrendering themselves into the brutal captivity of the vengeful Almeida. Soon only one large Gujarati Karak remained, larger than any other ship in the battle, and too close to shore to be boarded by most Portuguese vessels. But despite its size and sturdy construction, the immobilized vessel was no match for the concentrated firepower of the victorious Portuguese fleet, and had no available avenue to escape as the smaller boats in the channel had. With its sinking, the harbor of Diu fell silent, the Portuguese having won a decisive victory that would secure their dominance in the Indian Ocean for decades. Portuguese losses were remarkably light, at 32 dead and 300 wounded. On the Muslim side, the Mamluks suffered the worst losses by far, losing their entire fleet and most of their men, though Amir Hussein escaped to shore with a small party to return to Cairo. The losses suffered by Malik Ayaz's largely mercenary force were similarly steep, bringing the total death toll to over 1,500. After a decisive Portuguese victory at the Battle of Diu in 1509 against Calicut, the Mamluks and the Sultanate of Gujarat, Portugal's dominance in the Indian Ocean would be unchallenged for nearly three decades. Central to these early Portuguese campaigns was Alfonso de Albuquerque, a masterful admiral and statesman. Acting with considerable autonomy in waters far distant from his homeland, he had already seized Muscat and Hormuz before the Muslim stand at Diu, and was elevated to become governor of Portuguese India in the same year, with the conquest of Goa following soon after. Despite a failure to capture Aden, by his death in 1515, Alfonso had established an effective network of ports and bases that would allow the Portuguese to fight on even terms a world away from their home shores. For the Mamluks, on the other hand, the loss of Indian trade was devastating. The flourishing trade port of Alexandria fell into stagnation and decline, with spices instead flowing into Lisbon. In an attempt to make up the loss, the Mamluks turned to oppressive taxation, causing instability and discontent. This proved to be one of the greatest factors in allowing the Ottoman Sultan Selim to rapidly defeat what had once been a major rival with the local nobility of Syria defecting en masse to Selim when he invaded in 1516. By the beginning of February 1517, Ottoman armies had entered Cairo and subjugated the nation. In doing so, Selim indirectly landed his first blow against the Portuguese, as their initial aim had been to capture Egypt and take control of the established trade routes, rather than diverting them through a long chain of expensive and vulnerable bases. But Egypt's change in rulers did not change the realities faced by Arab merchants in the Indian Ocean, and the Ottomans quickly found that they had inherited their predecessor's piracy crisis. Although no outright hostilities would occur between the Ottomans and the Portuguese during the reign of Salim, there was no doubt that war was inevitable, and each empire sought to gain allies and influence among the local rulers of India and East Africa in order to strengthen their position. Of chief importance were the ports of Aden, Hormuz, Basra and Diu, most of which would change hands more than once over the decades to follow. 
In their search for allies against the Portuguese, the Ottomans found common cause with the Somali Sultanates of Adel and Ajaran, and with the Sultanate of Gujarat in northwestern India. Gujarat had formerly been a dominant regional power before the Mughal Empire's incursions by land and Portuguese power at sea left it weakened and diminished, forced into tributary status to stronger empires to retain its autonomy. After being on the losing side of the Battle of Diu, a humiliating defeat in the heart of its territory, Gujarat would turn to the Ottomans for aid in maintaining control of its crucial trade ports. With the Balkan and Persian Wars still looming, and without access to the Persian Gulf, however, direct Ottoman intervention would be minimal at first. Some efforts were made to shore up the Ottoman Red Sea fleet prior to the capture of Basra. In 1525, Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha reorganized the old Mamluk fleet, with Selman Reis again serving as admiral after a short imprisonment, possibly for his earlier defection to the Mamluks. Having already beaten the Portuguese fleet once off Jeddah in 1517, arranging his galleys in a tight formation under the cover of the shore batteries so as to force the ocean-going Portuguese ships to either retreat or fight a Mediterranean-style battle of borders and fire ships, Selman managed to do what both the Mamluks and the Portuguese had failed to do, and secured effective control of Yemen by 1527. This marked the first serious Ottoman challenge to Portuguese dominance in the Indian Ocean, and Selman's victories encouraged the numerous Muslim rulers in western India to turn to the Ottoman Empire for protection as their suzerain. In the following years, Ottoman soldiers and military experts would be sent to the courts of Gujarat and Calicut, simultaneously strengthening the defences of crucial port cities, increasing the influence of the Ottoman Sultan abroad, and giving credibility to his recently adopted title of Caliph. One of these consulting Ottoman generals would soon be called on to do battle with the Portuguese on the site of the Portuguese triumph of 1509, Diu. Together with Surat on the opposite side of the Gulf of Kambet, Diu was among the most important trading hubs of Western India, and would represent a major prize for the Portuguese. It was thus in Diu that the Ottoman-Portuguese wars would start in earnest, with a large Portuguese fleet of over 400 ships, carrying close to 6,000 soldiers, attacking the city's Gujarati and Ottoman garrison in 1531. Led by Alfonso's successor as governor of Portuguese India, Admiral Nuno de Cunha, this new fleet was significantly stronger than the one that had been victorious against the Mamluks in 1509. And unlike the first fleet, this one carried a fearsome mixed army of Portuguese soldiers and conscripted auxiliaries from the Malabar coast, which had shown its effectiveness in numerous engagements already. However, despite boasting complete naval superiority over the mere 18 Ottoman ships arrayed against them, de Cunha had met his match in Mustafa Bayram. The unparalleled Ottoman artillery crews dealt severe damage to the besiegers, while the narrow waterways separating Diu Island from the mainland frustrated Portuguese efforts to bring the firepower of their large fleet to bear. This first siege of Diu demonstrated the limitations of both empires. While de Cunha could not overcome the combination of Gujarati numbers and Ottoman gunnery to capture the city, neither could Mustafa Bayram destroy de Cunha's fleet to end the threat it posed. The fortress remained Gujarati, but the sea remained Portuguese, with de Cunha plundering Surat and other poorly defended Gujarati ports after withdrawing in defeat from Diu. The Ottoman-Portuguese wars would not begin in earnest until seven years later, though. In a bizarre twist, the roles of the two empires would be almost completely reversed in the Second Siege. Increasing military pressure from the Mughal Empire, combined with the inability of the Ottomans to protect their maritime interests, drove Sultan Bahadur to sign the Treaty of Bassein in 1534, and cede numerous islands and territories, including Bombay and Diu, despite the successful defence of the city three years prior. In the same year, Suleiman took Baghdad from the Safavids and gained the nominal fealty of Basra, opening a new avenue to the Indian Ocean. 
With his war in Persia ending, and affairs in Europe quiet for the time being, Suleiman finally turned to confront the Portuguese head-on, building shipyards in the Suez and Yemen, and greatly expanding his Red Sea fleet. The drowning of Sultan Bahadur during negotiations aboard a Portuguese vessel in 1537 provided the spark of war, and in 1538, the Ottoman fleet under the command of Hadim Suleiman Pasha attacked Diu Fort, laying siege to the same city they had helped defend seven years prior. Although the Ottoman fleet numbered only 80 ships, compared to the 400 ships the Portuguese had fielded in 1531, they were of heavier build than the light galleys comprising most of the Portuguese fleet, and it carried a similar force of soldiers. Though a naval engagement still would have favoured the Portuguese, the Ottoman Armada had caught the Portuguese largely by surprise and arrived unopposed on September 4th after capturing and plundering Aden en route. De Cunha and other Portuguese admirals had expected the Ottoman fleet to make for Muscat or Hormuz, but once again it was here, due. Upon landing, the 6,000 Turkish soldiers aboard the royal galleys of the Armada disembarked to join a larger force of 16,000 Gujarati soldiers under the command of Kajar Safar, which had been besieging the fortress for the past two months, though with little success due to a lack of ships and cannon. Also present was the Ottoman captain, Hoja Safaj, who maintained a small Turkish force in Gujarat after Mustafa Bayram's departure to preserve the waning influence of the Ottoman Sultan over their Indian ally. With only 3,000 Portuguese in the fort, of which only 600 were soldiers under Antonio de Silveira's command, the vastly superior Ottoman and Gujarati numbers appeared insurmountable, especially when backed by Ottoman siege gunnery. But the Portuguese still held a number of advantages. Firstly, the fort they were defending was newly built along European lines, greatly superior to the outdated medieval fortifications it had replaced. A small bastion in the channel to the north, placed halfway between the fort and a redoubt on the mainland, allowed chains to be drawn across the Diu channel to cut off the Ottoman galleys. Secondly, the alliance between Suleiman and Mahmud Shah III of Gujarat was weaker than it might seem. Despite the Portuguese having abandoned the city of Diu without battle upon the arrival of the Gujarati army, falling back into the fort to make their stand, a force of Ottoman janissaries ransacked it shortly after disembarking. The senseless damage enraged many Gujarati nobles, and with Mahmud Shah's succession already disputed, he risked losing his throne if too much of the nobility turned against his Ottoman patrons. This diplomatic breakdown would hamper the Ottomans in the coming siege, with the Gujaratis reluctant to supply the hungry Ottoman force. And lastly, the Ottomans were not willing to risk their fleet in open battle so far from their home shores, putting them under pressure to capture the fort quickly before Portuguese reinforcements from Goa could arrive. Despite these various disadvantages, the Ottomans made rapid progress building siege works about the surrounded fort, and by September 28th, a punishing bombardment was underway. But the first hasty attempts to storm the walls were repulsed with significant losses. As the volleys continued over the coming month, various attempts would be made to weaken the defences. First, Kadja Safa targeted the Portuguese strongpoint on the north bank of the Diu Channel, assaulting it with Gujarati forces backed up by Ottoman guns. The small fort's 40 Portuguese defenders held firm, however, and Kadja's attempt to smoke the defenders out with fire ships was foiled when a Portuguese nighttime attack lit the craft prematurely. This initial Portuguese victory would be short-lived. On October 1st, the redoubt's commander, Francisco Pacheco, was forced to surrender after narrowly beating back a second assault by Hardin's janissaries. Despite an agreement between Suleiman Pasha and Pacheco to grant safe passage to the fort, the remaining defenders were imprisoned on the Pasha's galley. The redoubt had been silenced, though this was a small victory, and all the Ottomans had to show for most of a month of effort. 
In an attempt to avoid the losses a continued siege would entail, Suleiman Pasha had the captured de Pacheco write a letter to de Silveya, detailing the good treatment he had received on the Pasha's galley and the overwhelming power of the Ottoman army in an attempt to secure de Silveya's surrender. This would prove unsuccessful, however, with de Silveya viewing Pacheco's imprisonment as an act of treachery by Suleiman. With the negotiations a failure, the Ottomans returned to the siege, with the last of their artillery unloaded and in place by October 5th. But even with the full force of their army brought to bear, attempts to assault the fortress through the partially collapsed bulwarks on October 12th and 13th failed, and the efforts of Ottoman sappers to breach the walls with gunpowder charges were hampered by barricades erected within the walls by Portuguese non-combatants. The next target of the besiegers would be the sea fort in the Diu Channel, with Ottoman galleys attempting to storm it on October 27th and 28th. But without any surrounding landmass to disembark besiegers on, attackers would be forced to scale the sea fort's walls directly from their galleys, a difficult task in the face of the cannon fire and firebombs of the well-stocked Portuguese garrison. 18 galleys in total would be committed between the two attacks, but despite significant casualties, the defenders of the sea fort successfully weathered the attacks and forced the battered galleys into retreat. After the failure to capture the sea fort, the cracks were beginning to show in the Allied siege effort. The simmering dispute between the Ottomans and the Gujarati nobility left Suleiman Pasha's army in a precarious position for supplies, and despite the strength of the Ottoman fleet, they were unable to prevent swift Portuguese voices from making landings to resupply and reinforce the defenders. Faced with the possibility of being cut off by the Portuguese fleet in Goa, Suleiman Pasha could not risk prolonging the fruitless siege. On October 30th, the Ottoman forces began withdrawing back to their ships. De Silveya knew better than to drop his guard while still surrounded, however. His vigilance would pay off when the Ottoman retreat proved to be a last ruse by Suleiman Pasha, who launched a massive final attack on the morning of the 31st. The majority of the Ottoman Gujarati army, as many as 14,000, attacked under a heavy artillery barrage. The 600 soldiers that had held the fort at the beginning of the siege had since dwindled to 100 or fewer, with more of the soldiers now imprisoned on Ottoman galleys than remaining to defend the fort. But with the situation as dire as it had become, much of the fort's civilian population took up arms in its defence as well, with some sources suggesting a group of female soldiers saw active duty in the frenzied battle. Damage to the fortress bulwarks was severe, and at several points along the walls, Gujarati or Ottoman soldiers succeeded in winning their way onto the ramparts to raise their banners above the beleaguered fort. But just as in the initial assaults, the time constraints the besiegers faced worked against them. In their haste to crush the remaining opposition, the troops attacking the walls were exposed to significant friendly fire from the ongoing cannon volleys. Though the fighting on October 31st would stretch the defenders to the breaking point, the attackers were again repulsed, and though similar attacks on the following days would have inevitably ended in an Ottoman victory, no more would be forthcoming. A relief force of 24 Portuguese galleys was mistaken for the vanguard of the governor's powerful Goa fleet, while a small sortie by the remaining defenders created the impression that the fort was still garrisoned to withstand another attack. On November 6th, the Ottoman fleet hurriedly embarked for Yemen, while Qajar Safar torched his camp and withdrew to the mainland. A mere 40 soldiers remained fit for battle inside the fort when the relief fleet arrived, yet they had held off the largest Ottoman expedition ever dispatched to India, with the Turkish Armada returning to Yemen 1,200 men lighter. The failure to capture Diu was a major loss for the Ottomans, weakening their influence in India and straining their critical alliance with the Gujarat Sultanate. Spice would continue to work its way around the Cape of Good Hope, 
with even the merchants of Venice at times forced to purchase from their Portuguese rivals. But Suleiman's efforts in the Indian Ocean had not been for naught. The construction of shipyards in Basra and Aden had greatly strengthened the Ottoman position compared to the feeble Mamluks. While Ibrahim Pasha and Selman Reis's improved fleet had forced the Portuguese to end their long Red Sea blockade. Therefore, though the Ottomans had failed to drive the Portuguese from the Indian Ocean, they did succeed in reinvigorating the Egyptian spice trade, with Arab and Indian merchants again braving the risk of Portuguese piracy to sell their wares in Alexandria. The old and new trade routes would uneasily coexist over the next decades as the rival empires competed for dominance. Thought to be the birthplace of the human species and the center of one of antiquity's great empires, the history of Ethiopia is long and storied. When the exploring Portuguese first made landfall in the diminished kingdom of Ethiopia or Abyssinia during their early forays into the Indian Ocean, it seemed to them an exotic hermit kingdom hidden from the world and from the passage of time. To them, this was a devoutly Christian kingdom ruled by the Crusade-era legend of Prester John, surrounded by coastal Muslim states and pastoral tribes. The Prester John myth held powerful sway over Europe for a century or more, with official papal envoys even being sent to find and coordinate with the elusive emperor. There were, of course, many differences in reality. For one, Ethiopia was anything but a hermit kingdom. Under the empire of Aksum, which Christianized only shortly after Rome in 330 AD, Ethiopians traded and clashed with Rome and Persia as a near equal, even dominating the southern areas of Arabia for long stretches of time. Though Indian Ocean trade had become a largely Islamic enterprise during the conversion of the coastal regions, with Muslim traders and dynasties establishing themselves as far south as Zanzibar by riding the reliable monsoon winds, Ethiopia remained closely connected to the wider Indian Ocean. Though rival sultanates rose and fell among the Somalis, none were able to create a single state to unify the coastal regions leaving them to generally accept Ethiopian suzerainty. Muslim merchants ruled the waves during the 15th century, but tributes and taxes poured into the coffers of the Nergus, and Ethiopia's slaves and ivory flowed unabated to markets in Egypt and India. An Ethiopian delegation had even attended the Council of Florence in 1441, where they were excitedly welcomed as subjects of Prester John despite their every assertion that their Nergus, or emperor, was called Zari Yaqob and bore no such title. The years just prior to the Ottoman entry into the Indian Ocean had not been kind to Ethiopia, however. Throughout the 14th century, the nearest thing to a Muslim rival to the empire had been the Sultanate of Ifat under the Walasma dynasty, a disunified state ruling over a coastal merchant elite, often loyal to the Ethiopian Nergus, and a pastoralist semi-nomadic population generally unconcerned with the borders or conflicts of the two states. An attempt by Sultan Sabreddin to invade Ethiopia in 1332 led the warrior king Amdaseyam to sack and conquer most of Ifat. Further conflict in the following decades led to the Sultanate's destruction by Amdaseyon's grandson Dawit in 1403. But from its ashes would emerge a far more formidable foe. As Ifat crumbled, the Walasma dynasty split in two. Some of the ruling family opted to remain in the former lands of Ifat, retaining some wealth and influence. The more militant branches of the family headed east to found the Sultanate of Adal, centered in Hara. In the century that followed, succession crises and weak monarchs would weaken Ethiopia's hold over both its coastal Muslim tributaries and the increasingly powerful Christian feudal nobility at home, while Adal prospered from trade 
and bolstered its military might through the conversion of Afar and Somali pastoralists to Islam. Still, in 1516, Ethiopia remained strong, and with the aid of a Portuguese fleet, Nogusleb Nadengel scored a significant victory against Adel, killing its sultan Mafus and even burning Ifat's old capital of Zela. Chroniclers triumphantly declared the Muslim threat ended forever, but the following years would change everything. In 1517, Salim the Grim conquered Egypt and gained his first foothold in the Indian Ocean. Adal would be quick to forge ties with this powerful new neighbor, allowing for the acquisition of modern armaments Ethiopia largely lacked. The Ottomans, for their part, saw Adal as a useful ally, given the partial Portuguese blockade of the Red Sea. The succession crisis sparked by the death of Mafuz led to the usurpation of the state by the former soldier Imam Ahmad ibn Ibrahim in 1520. Despite never claiming the title of the Sultan, Ahmad, called Grenye for his left-handedness, was militant and visionary, who intended to overthrow the Solomonic Empire by conquest, positioning himself as the Nergus of a Muslim Ethiopia. In 1529, he launched his first forays into the Ethiopian highlands, challenging Lebnadengel and sparking a war that would outlive them both. The first encounter between the two kings was a decisive victory for Grany. Bolstered by Ottoman manufactured firearms, and possibly even a contingent of Ottoman troops, Grany inflicted heavy casualties on the larger Ethiopian army before driving it from the swampy field in the Battle of Simbrakure. Such a dramatic victory, a mere 50 kilometers east of today's Addis Ababa, threw the empire into disarray, and after a brief period of consolidation, Gran pushed northwards, easily overthrowing Ethiopian power in the largely Muslim regions of Shewa and Amhara. He granted long-suppressed local elites the authority they had lost under Ethiopian rule, effectively integrating new territory as fast as his armies could conquer it. Further confrontations would solidify Adal's advantage over the crumbling Ethiopian army. General Wassan Sagat, tasked with guarding the eastern and southern provinces in the wake of Lebnadengel's withdrawal, was killed in battle at Mount Busat in 1531, while other Ethiopian armies broke and scattered before the shock and awe created by the unfamiliar cannons. During the second battle between Grany and Labnadengel at the fortress of Ambasel near the Bashalo River, Labnadengel was almost captured by the victorious Imam while his army routed around him. By the end of 1531, only the fortified central highlands remained securely Ethiopian. The once great warrior king of Ethiopia was a virtual prisoner in the innermost regions of his empire, with the Adalites dominant as far west as Lake Tanna. In the more Christian-dominated areas, stiffer resistance was put up to Gren's advance. Aksum represented a major prize for Gren, being the seat of the first great Ethiopian empire, a legacy Gran wished to invoke in a close echo to the Ottomans' own claims of successorship to the Roman Empire. Yet here, a few Turkish Christian converts had furnished the Ethiopian defenders with firearms of their own. Though Aksum would fall with the rest of the Tigray region after a difficult siege, with Granu destroying the Church of Mary of Zion in punishment for its stiff resistance, it did check his advance until 1533. The degree of direct Ottoman support Gran received in the earlier years of his campaign is rather unclear, highlighting another failing of the Portuguese chroniclers that otherwise provide a remarkably detailed account of the conflict. Nevertheless, the devastating impact of Ottoman-made arms is undeniable in the rapid collapse of the Horn of Africa's strongest power. Lebnadengel was helpless to oppose Gran and after the fall of the royal compound of Ambergeshen, spent the last years of his life an effective fugitive within his own realm. 
alongside the widespread fighting, famine ravaged the highlands, cut off from crop tributes and subject to frequent raiding. But all was not lost for the Solomonic Kingdom, and the following years would see a new force enter the fray, countering the Ottoman support. In 1535, with his own armies on the run, the vanquished emperor had sent an appeal for aid to the King of Portugal. Portuguese aid would not arrive within his lifetime, but the call for help he sent may well have saved his dynasty. Not long after the ascension of his son Galogiwas, 400 Portuguese musketmen, along with numerous craftsmen and gunsmiths, arrived in Massawa in February of 1541, where they were joined by small contingents of loyal Ethiopian warriors. Sebla Wangel, queen mother of Ethiopia, served as their guide and attaché as they marched out in hopes of joining their force to that of Galogiwas. Pushing into the Tigray region, they won a number of decisive battles, despite the greatly superior numbers of the Adelite garrisons. Grenye himself was injured during an utter rout at Jata, leading Cristoval's chronicler, Miguel de Castagnoso, to declare that with a hundred horses to pursue with, the whole threat of Adal might have been ended. However, the rainy season slowed Cristavo's advance into Tigray considerably, and a number of Adelite-held fortresses still stood between him and Galogios. And while the local populace largely supported Cristavo as a fellow Christian, Adelite forces in the region remained an ever-present threat. By 1542, the broader Ottoman-Portuguese war was at its height. The defeat at Diu had been just four years earlier, with the Ottoman fleet still at large as Sultan Suleiman searched for new ways to undermine his Portuguese rivals. Thus, when Ahmad Gren's call for help brought news of the Portuguese presence in Ethiopia to Suleiman's attention, the Adal War became a new front against a major rival. Determined not to allow Portuguese-backed Ethiopia to gain a presence in the Gulf of Aden and block off the Red Sea again, and hoping to stamp out the tenacious Christian kingdom entirely, Suleiman authorized a sizable expedition to enter the war on the Adelite side. From Zabid in Yemen, 900 Turkish and 2,000 Arab soldiers embarked across the Red Sea to aid their African ally. When Cristavo returned to Wufla in August 1542, fresh off his victory seizing Amber Cell back from the Adelites to open the path to Galogios, he was unwittingly walking into the jaws of the much larger Ottoman Adelite force. On August 28th, the Portuguese expedition was shattered in the Battle of Wufla. Some 120 Portuguese managed to escape the slaughter, fleeing with Sebla Wangel while the rest either fell in battle or became prisoners of the Sultan. Cristavo was among the captured, though he would not live long in Ahmad Gran's custody. After 13 years of war, with the Portuguese defeated, Ahmad Gran seems to have concluded that at this point his victory was complete. To an outside observer, this conclusion might have seemed a safe one, but Grenye's assumption that the remaining Portuguese had simply scattered was incorrect. The 120 soldiers left of the expedition had in fact retreated back through Ambacel to join up with Galogios. As their excess supplies and powder had been safely stored in Ambacel when Cristavo met with disaster in Wafla, they were able to arm and train numerous Ethiopians to fight as musketmen. Several long months were spent in training and preparation, with the first Ethiopian-made muskets and gunpowder being produced to further narrow the advantage in arms and numbers held by the Adelites. Finally, on February 6, 1543, Golodjuos marched out for Lake Tanna at the head of his new combined army. Lebna Dengel's army had been unprepared for gunpowder warfare, and Cristavo's had been small and unfamiliar with the landscape, but Galogios's combined the strengths of both into something far greater. On February 21st, 
his army met the Adelites in what would be the deciding battle of the war. Though outnumbered, they took Ahmad Grenya and his forces by surprise, secure as the Adelites were in their victory. Accounts of the battle are unfortunately somewhat questionable, most significantly the numbers of soldiers involved, with the Chronicle claiming 9,000 Ethiopians against 15,000 Adelites. As the Ethiopian monarchy had only just a few years earlier been effectively exiled, it seems unlikely they could have so rapidly mobilized an army larger than the army Lebnadengo had drawn from the whole of a unified Ethiopia. And as the Adelites were not on active campaign when they met Galoduos at Lake Tanna, well within what they considered safely subdued territory, it is equally unlikely that Granya would have the entirety of his forces mobilized. Most of the warriors he had relied upon during his conquests were pastoralist tribes, which would have returned to their lands and herds with the plunder of the previous year's victories. But even if the numbers are exaggerated, the significance of the battle's outcome can hardly be overstated. The Adelites fought bravely and competently despite the disarray the Ethiopians had caught them in, buoyed up as they were by the skilled Ottoman and Yemeni gunners and by their own years of hard-won experience. But the addition of gunnery to the Ethiopian army would do the Adelite campaign. Ahmad Gran found his position the target of concentrated volleys of musket fire. Soon enough, a bullet found its way through the Adelite lines to the intended target of the barrage, killing the Imam and shattering Adelite morale. Another tradition holds that their surprise and disorganization allowed for a single Portuguese musketeer to rush a gap in their lines, reaching Ahmad Granya himself as he shouted orders over the deafening musket fire. Mere moments later, both fell mortally wounded, the musketeer having shot Granya through the breast before being set upon by the surrounding Adelite soldiers. This heroic account is not related by Castagnosa and is likely a fabrication, but however the Imam's death came to be, its impact on his forces was the same. The past 14 years of war had been the product of one man's vision. The shock of his death broke the morale of the Adelites, and in a remarkably close echo to the Portuguese flight after Cristavo's death, the remnants of the Turkish and Yemeni force fled back to the coast of Adel with Gren's widow, Batidel Wambara. On the battlefield they left behind, Gran's body was beheaded, with the grisly trophy displayed to all surrounding countryside to spread word of the great conqueror's passing. The war would drag on for five years further, with Adel under the control of Gran's nephew, Na'ibn Mujahid, due to his son's capture by the Portuguese. Though Gran's death had largely ended the existential threat Adel posed to Ethiopia. Though Adel retained much of its strong army, Nur failed to inspire the same dread or loyalty his uncle had, leading to a gradual Ethiopian reclamation of the lost territories. Nur's legacy would not be in the form of conquest, but in the construction of Hara's impressive and still standing walls. Soon, the war turned to stalemate, and then to peace between the two bloodied and exhausted powers. Adal retained dominion over the coast and freedom from the tributes a stronger Ethiopia had levied on the coastal Muslim states in ages past, making the war a victory from the Ottoman perspective. Though Ethiopia would retain its ties to Portugal, it would not play any major role in combating the Ottomans in the Indian Ocean without proper coastal access. But from the perspective of Adel, and especially Ethiopia, the war had been catastrophically destructive. The following decades would see a new force emerge to challenge both states in the form of migrating Oromo tribes, with the battered and exhausted nations helpless to combat their advance. Nur's great walls would be put to the test not by the Ethiopians they had been built to ward off, but by the Oromo, shortly before the Sultanate's collapse in 1577.
the Ottoman defeat at Diu in 1538 might have seemed like a significant blow to Ottoman ambitions in the Indian Ocean. However, despite the failure of Hadim Suleiman Pasha, governor of Ottoman Egypt, to capture the port, the more extensive campaign of 1538 was welcomed in Constantinople as a huge success. On the military side, control of Yemen had been won by the Ottoman fleet before it departed for Diu. But Hadim Suleiman, despite his age and infirmity, was also waging a determined diplomatic campaign against Portugal, one that was expanding the Ottomans' reach far faster than ships or soldiers could. At the same time Hadim Suleiman was besieging Diu, operating out of the Karela region and led by Pate Marika, began preying on Portuguese shipping in South India and the Sea of Ceylon, allied with the Ottomans in a close echo to the Barbary Corsairs of North Africa. Even as far away as modern Indonesia, the outreaches and political connections of 80-year-old Hadim Suleiman were winning bloodless victories for the Ottoman Empire, with four ships bearing a tribute in spice from the Sultan of Aceh arriving in the Red Sea in 1538, before returning to Aceh the following year, loaded with Ottoman troops under the command of Hamad Khan. Even in Gujarat, the defeat at Diu had not been as complete as it might have seemed. The Ottoman merchant community in Gujarat held enough political sway in the Sultan's court to get their leader, Kadja Safar, appointed governor of Surat, and enough wealth to organize fortifications and ships of their own in preparation for another attack. In light of these successes, Hadim Suleiman Pasha would be elevated to the position of Grand Vizier by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1541, heralding a period of intense Indian Ocean focus for the Ottoman Empire. On the Portuguese side, by 1541, the situation was beginning to look rather dire. Portugal remained the dominant Indian Ocean power in many respects. Both Pate Marica's fleet and Hamad Khan's 1539 attempt to besiege Portuguese Malacca had been defeated. But Ottoman influence remained strong in both theatres, and as the Ottomans aimed mostly to protect independent Muslim merchants and revitalize the long blockaded Red Sea trade routes, they continued to find easy allies against Portuguese dominance. Further complicating this period is that both Sultan Suleiman and King John III of Portugal claimed a divine mandate to control the Indian Ocean, Suleiman through his role as Caliph and John through the Treaty of Tordesillas and accompanying papal bull into Quetera. This religious aspect of the conflict made compromise difficult, and even as the Portuguese position grew weaker, John remained unwilling to make significant concessions in exchange for peace. Instead, after being on the defensive throughout the past years, the Portuguese decided to put their fleet to the test in a major counterattack, targeting the Ottoman shipyards of Suez. In January of 1541, the governor of Portuguese India, Estevão de Gama, son of legendary explorer Vasco de Gama, sailed for the Red Sea with a fleet of 40 ships and 2,300 soldiers. The expedition was facing major problems before it had even departed, however. Kedja Safar in Surat had caught wind of the attack and sent the Ottomans advance warning. The fleet would also find itself plagued with massive supply issues, becoming apparent as they reached their first destination of Masawa. The intention had been to make only a short stop in Masawa, from which Isteval's younger brother, Cristovo, and his 400 musketeers could disembark while the fleet resupplied before continuing on to Suez. But with the Ethiopian Adel War raging and famine ravaging the Horn of Africa, the Ethiopians in Misawa were unable to provide nearly enough food or supplies to last the large fleet to Suez. This meant that nearly half of the ships and soldiers intended for the Suez assault were forced to stay behind in Misawa, living off the meager charity the subjects of Golodjuos could provide. In addition, the Portuguese were largely unfamiliar with the Red Sea, having previously simply blockaded it at the Strait of Aden and the poor winds caused the remainder of Isteval's ships to make slow progress. 
the thirsty and dwindling fleet was forced to divide twice into ever smaller task forces, raiding Suakin and several villages along the Arabian coast, while heat and lack of water took a sharp toll. By the end of March, only 16 small oared ships and 250 men remained with Istival, the rest of the fleet having turned back to Misawa. This paltry force arrived in Suez in late April to find it well reinforced with a strong battery of shore guns and 2,000 Sipahi cavalry. After a short exchange of fire, the hopelessness of the Portuguese situation became clear and a retreat was called. Another excruciating month would pass before Isteval made it back to Misawa, where he found that mutiny had racked the fleet as it lay in port, with over 100 soldiers deserting, only to be set upon and killed by tribesmen under Ahmed Grand's banner. More ships and men were lost to storms on the return to Goa, a humiliating end to the largest scale offensive the Portuguese had ever attempted in the Indian Ocean. In the aftermath of this catastrophic defeat, the Portuguese were forced to watch as Ottoman merchants ventured out even further, and Hadim Suleiman won ever more allies, with Ottoman merchants regularly trading as far south as the Swahili coast by 1544. The greatest threat to the now dominant Ottoman Empire in the coming years would not come from further Portuguese offensives, but from factionalism. Despite his successes in the Indian Ocean, Hadim Suleiman Pasha was removed from his position as Grand Vizier in 1544 after accusations of embezzlement and died later the same year. In his place rose Rustem Pasha, the Sultan's son-in-law and a major rival of both Hadim Suleiman and his protege Dord Pasha, who had taken over as governor of Egypt. Rustem's paranoia and distrust of Dord who had once spread a false rumour that Rustem suffered from syphilis while the two men had been competing for the hand of the Sultan's daughter, would lead to several heavy-handed attempts to weaken his rivals in the Indian Ocean provinces, with often disastrous results. The first example of Rustem's distaste for Indian Ocean matters would be in 1546, when Kajar Safar and Sultan Mahmud of Gujarat launched a second attack on Diu. This assault had been years in the preparation and had every possibility of success, but despite this, Rustem refused to send any direct Ottoman support for the siege. The governor of Zebid, being a relative of Kajasafar's, did send a small detachment of janissaries and artillery to support the Gujarati effort, but compared to the huge expedition Hadim Suleiman had taken to Diu in 1538, it was clear little support would be coming from Rustem Pasha or the Ottoman central government. The Gujarati force was powerful in its own right though, and the second defensive due stretched the Portuguese almost to the breaking point, as all available ships and soldiers were brought to reinforce the vital fortress. The officer in charge of the Gujarati center, a Turk by the name of Safi Agha, who had previously overseen the construction of Surat's walls, built a set of stone ramparts facing the fortress walls, from which the Gujarati and Ottoman cannons began firing in June 1546. The accurate return fire from the defenders would neutralize much of the artillery, however, and Safi Aga was himself killed by falling debris as Portuguese cannons battered the ramparts. In August, another officer, Jahangir Khan, would deal severe damage to the fort through the use of sappers and cause great casualties to the Portuguese defenders within. But the overall commander of the Gujarati army, Burhan ul Mulk, failed to capitalize on the breach in the fort's walls, later being accused of cowardice by Arab chronicler Zafar ul Wali. An attempted night attack on the damaged fortifications by another Turk, Jujar Khan, was discovered and repulsed by the Portuguese, with Jucha being struck in the temple by a bullet and falling from the walls to his death. By the time the Portuguese Viceroy arrived with further reinforcements to break the siege in November, both sides had taken severe casualties in the long months of bombardment and assaults, yet the fort still held firm. 
Qatar Safar had been among the fallen, and his community of Ottoman merchants and expatriates had borne the brunt of the fighting, suffering the most severe casualties and largest expenses, largely ending their existence as a major political power within Gujarat. Much like in the first siege of Diu, the defeat of the Ottomans' allies at Diu was partially offset by opportunistic gains elsewhere. While the full strength of Portuguese India was devoted to defending Diu's walls, Ottoman governors and allies in Arabia sacked Muscat, captured the Portuguese allied port of Kishin, and ousted a rebellious tribal governor in Basra to bring the crucial province under direct Ottoman control. But Rustem Pasha's abandonment of Hadim Suleiman's network of alliances had cost the Ottomans a unique opportunity to oust the Portuguese from India, and his policies would create further disasters in the coming years. The first of these would be the appointment of Uvez Pasha as governor of Ottoman Yemen in 1547. Uvez was a young and inexperienced officer, chosen for his personal loyalty to Rustem rather than talent. Within a year of his taking office, the whole of Yemen had risen up in revolt against the Ottomans, with local leaders inviting the Portuguese in to aid their rebellion, and Uvez Pasha being assassinated. This one rebellion came very close to undoing the Ottomans' gains of the previous decades, and only quick action on the part of Dord Pasha, circumventing the chain of command and bypassing Rustem, allowed the rebellion to be crushed before the Portuguese could intervene. After this debacle, Rustem made no further interventions in the Indian Ocean for several years, allowing relative peace to exist between the Ottomans and Portuguese from 1547 until 1552. But in 1552, Rustem would be back to meddling in full force, launching a massive but poorly conceived offensive against the Portuguese island stronghold of Hormuz. Before the expedition had even been launched, several problems were obvious. For one, the five years of peace had been very profitable for the Ottomans, as numerous Portuguese merchants had begun to trade illicitly with the Ottomans in Basra, rather than make the far longer journey around Africa. Despite the official ban on this trade, even the captain of Portuguese Hormuz seems to have had commercial contracts in Basra, demonstrating that relations were warming up between local Ottoman and Portuguese representatives even as the two empires remained hostile. A direct attack on Hormuz would shatter a status quo that had been very much in the Ottomans' favour. Another problem was the command structure of the great fleet Rustem Pasha was assembling in Besra. Most of the captains and admirals in charge were Rustem's loyalists from the Mediterranean navy, with little or no experience in the Indian Ocean. In overall command was Piri Reis, a legendary admiral and explorer in his own right, but now nearly 90 years old and reluctant to return to service. The last problem was a heavily armed Portuguese warship that had arrived in Hormuz, purely by chance, just ahead of the Ottoman fleet in April 1552. Having lost a large portion of their munitions in a shipwreck prior to making landfall, the Ottoman force pillaged the surrounding city but found themselves unable to crack the fort's defences, bolstered as they were by the warship's crew and guns. At this failure, Piri Reis quickly lost his nerve and brought the fleet back to Basra, then abandoned his command to flee back to Suez with his plunder. Upon his return, the storied admiral would be executed for abandoning his post, while the fleet lay leaderless and trapped by a Portuguese blockade of the Strait of Hormuz. A first attempt to break this blockade by Murad Beg came close to succeeding, before being foiled by changing winds. A second attempt by Saidi Ali Reis, another Mediterranean admiral without any Indian Ocean experience, saw the Ottoman fleet ambushed near Muscat and destroyed almost entirely. The defeated Saidi Ali Reis managed to escape, eventually taking refuge with the Ottoman merchants of Gujarat after being cut off from returning to Suez but few others were so lucky. 
This string of naval defeats was a far greater disaster than any the Ottomans had yet faced in the Indian Ocean, and a major humiliation for Rustem Pasha, who was removed from his position as Grand Vizier later the same year. In his place arose first Semiz Ali Pasha, and then in 1565, the famous Sokolu Mehmed Pasha, who would oversee the last years of the Ottoman-Portuguese War and serve as Grand Vizier for three sultans. There would be no further confrontations on the scale of Diu or Hormuz after Rustem Pasha's reign. A smaller failed attempt to capture Bahrain was made in 1559, and support was given to an Echenese assault on Malacca in 1568, but the Ottomans would not assemble another fleet of sufficient size to challenge the Portuguese in an open naval confrontation. This is not to suggest the Ottomans had been defeated or given up on their Indian Ocean ambitions, however. Having learned from the mistakes of Rustem Pasha, Semiz Ali Pasha placed the Indian Ocean fleet under the command of Sefer Reis, an incredibly successful corsair with years of experience raiding Portuguese shipping in India. Under Sefer Reis, the war took on a very different shape. Large, expensive Portuguese expeditions aimed at capturing Sefer would fail year after year, unable to corner the wily corsair. Smaller expeditions or poorly defended merchant ships would be set upon like lightning and captured, dragged back to Sefer's home base of Mocha. As the years dragged on, the costs of continuing the war continued to mount for the beleaguered Portuguese, while more and more of the lucrative Indian Ocean trade flowed into Ottoman ports. The Ottomans would see success by land as well, landing a strong force in Massawa under Ozdemir Pasha in 1556 and conquering modern Eritrea. Meanwhile, independent merchants and corsairs, from Arabia to Siam to Sumatra, were joining the Ottoman cause, forcing the Portuguese to fight a decentralized guerrilla war across the extent of their vast naval empire. One of the most crucial fronts of this war was Northern Africa, where Morocco had served as the seat of several powerful empires over the centuries, notably controlling much of modern-day Spain during the reigns of the Almoravids and Almohads, stalling and at times pushing back the ongoing Reconquista. By the late 16th century, these glory days were past. The Christian monarchies of Iberia not only ending Moorish rule in Iberia, but taking control of several strategic ports in North Africa. But while the Saudi Sultanate of Morocco may not have compared to the power of the Almohads, Morocco remained an important frontier with Portugal, Castile and the Ottomans each seeking to dominate Morocco through force or diplomacy. The turning point in this struggle would be 1557. Sultan Mohammed al-Sheikh of Morocco had chosen to align himself with Castile and was in the process of negotiating an alliance against the Ottomans. But before he could finalize such an alliance, he was assassinated on the orders of Bela Bey of Algeria, Hassan Pasha. His eldest son, Abdallah al-Ghalib, succeeded as Sultan, while his three younger sons fled Morocco to start lives in exile knowing their brother would likely have them executed to protect his new throne should they remain in their homeland. Their exile would be a long one, with none of the three setting foot in Morocco again for a full 17 years. But this exile was not a wasted one, with the three exiled princes being well received in Algeria, carrying favour with the man who had ordered their father's murder and establishing strong ties with the Ottoman Empire. The eldest of the three, Abd al-Mumin, even rose to become governor of Tlemcen. He would be assassinated there in 1571, not living to return to Morocco. But his surviving siblings, Abd al-Malik and Ahmed al-Mansur, would continue to bide their time in Algeria, learning the techniques of gunpowder warfare from Ottoman generals. When Abdallah al-Ghalib died in 1574, passing the throne to his son Abu Abdallah Muhammad, despite Abd al-Malik being the legitimate heir under Saudi succession law, the two brothers marched into Morocco with an Ottoman force 10,000 strong. 
After a two-year struggle, Abd al-Malik deposed his untested nephew, seizing the throne and sending Abu Abdallah into exile in Portugal. Now greatly indebted to his Ottoman benefactors, Abd al-Malik would bring Morocco into their sphere of influence in a number of ways during the early years of his reign. Though he refused to become an Ottoman vassal, or make Morocco a regency in the manner of Algeria, he did recognize the new Sultan Murad III as his caliph, and paid a sizable tribute to have the victorious Ottoman forces withdraw after the war's end. This caused great concern in Portugal, which had been fighting for decades to resist Ottoman expansion in the Indian Ocean, only to see their influence spread to Portugal's very doorstep. Thus, when Abu Abdallah appealed to King Sebastian in reclaiming the throne from his uncle, promising to convert to Christianity and rule as an ally of Portugal, Sebastian was quick to accept. With the full support of the merchants and nobility of Portugal, who feared an Ottoman-aligned Morocco would threaten Portugal's coasts and its commerce with Brazil, Sebastian sent out a call to crusade assembling a great army of mercenaries, volunteers, and soldiers of Portugal. Bolstered by Moors loyal to Abu Abdallah, the Crusaders invaded Morocco in 1568 with the aim of deposing Abd al-Malik. Abd al-Malik had not been idle in his short years of rule though, and had raised a powerful army trained in the Ottoman style. When he received word of this new challenge to his rule, he mobilized his forces, meeting Sebastian's army south of where the al Makazin River feeds into the Lucos. With the Lucos to their left and the foothills of the Rif Mountains to their right, the Moroccan army had chosen a location that would give them a significant advantage over the approaching army of King Sebastian and Abu Abdallah. Once the Portuguese and the various mercenaries, allies and volunteers that accompanied them crossed the river from the north, they found themselves without any easy means of retreat, hemmed in by water and mountains on three sides and by the Sultan's army on the fourth. The Moroccans, in contrast, had a clear line of retreat southeast to the nearby city Qasar al-Kabir should the Portuguese prove victorious. Abd al-Malik also had the advantage of numbers on his side, with his well-trained core army bolstered by Berber mercenary cavalry, refugee Moors driven from Iberia and a contingent of allied troops from Ottoman Algeria, swelling his ranks to over 60,000. Arrayed in two main lines, with a reserve force held behind the center and forces of cavalry on the flanks, Abd al-Malik's army arrayed in a broad formation across the wide plain in hopes of enveloping and encircling the smaller Portuguese force. Additional units of cavalry under his younger brother, Ahmad al-Mansur's command, were sequestered in the nearby mountains hidden from view of the approaching enemy. The Portuguese force was greatly outnumbered, but the situation was not so bleak as it might have seemed, and Sebastian's diverse army held several advantages of its own. Numbering 23,000 in total, approximately half of this force were Portuguese regulars, bolstered by over 5,000 well-experienced volunteers and mercenaries from Germany, France and Castile, as well as 6,000 Moroccans loyal to Abu Abdallah. Compared to this professional force under Sebastian, many of the soldiers in Abd al-Malik's army, whether called up from the local townspeople or from among the exiled Moorish communities, were hastily equipped civilians. The Crusader army was even better equipped than Abd al-Malik's regular army with more cannons to bring to bear than the larger Moroccan-Algerian force could muster. The mercenary captain Thomas Stuckley, an exiled English Catholic rebel and a veteran of Lepanto, commanded the mercenaries in the centre as the Portuguese army drew up in a square formation, bristling with pikes, cannons and muskets. On both sides the high stakes were clear with the three monarchs on the field inspiring their loyal supporters to fight bravely and zealously in the coming battle. The battle was opened with an exchange of cannon fire as the Moroccans advanced, an exchange that played to the strengths of the better equipped Portuguese army. Unfortunately for the Portuguese, the relatively small number of cannons on the battlefield, 
with a mere 40 in Portuguese hands against 34 Moroccan, made this cannon barrage more of a warm-up than a decisive confrontation. Though the bombardment did sow some confusion among the less experienced units in Abd al-Malik's army, neither army was significantly damaged in the opening salvos, and it would not be long before the two armies became embroiled in a general melee. There are certain conflicting versions of the battle itself. The Battle of Alcazar, an epic play by George Peel, published in England 16 years later, provides one fairly contemporary account and has done much to shape the popular memory of the pivotal battle. However, the play raises the Englishman Thomas Stuckley to be the narrative's central figure and greatly dramatizes certain aspects of the battle, throwing some of its claims into doubt. Central to its account of the battle is a charge by the Duke of Aveiro, George of Lancaster, with a retinue of men-at-arms against the Moroccan centre that nearly succeeds in routing the vast army of Abd al-Malik. This is a rather unlikely scenario, given the far greater Moroccan numbers and the strength of Abd al-Malik's centre, made up of professional soldiers and strengthened by units of reserves directly behind. But while certain elements in Peel's account, such as the Duke's charge, are clearly exaggerated, the heavy casualties suffered by both armies demonstrate that the battle was a fiercely contested one, and the tenacious defence Pele attributes to the Crusader army was no mere fabrication. Both George of Lacastre and King Sebastian led ferocious charges against their numerically superior foes, while on the Moroccan side, despite suffering from a severe fever following years of illness and having been carried to the battle in a litter, the ailing Sultan Abd al-Malik rode on horseback to keep up the morale of his forces. Unfortunately for Sebastian and Abu Abdallah, the decision to meet Abd al-Malik in open battle rather than taking defensive positions in the river's confluence allowed the Moroccans to take full advantage of their greater numbers enveloping the Portuguese square formation with their broad lines of advancing infantry. Ahmed al-Mansur's cavalry completed the encirclement and harried those in the Crusader army that attempted to escape the trap, whether to take up better positions or simply to flee from what was becoming a slaughter. Surrounded and outnumbered, the mercenaries and Abu Abdallah's Moors were the first to break ranks and flee, only to find themselves trapped by the surging rivers and run down by Berber cavalry. Behind them, the Portuguese square wavered and finally crumbled, weakened by desertions and overrun by enemy numbers. Each of the three monarchs in the battle would perish in different ways, along with 8,000 in the Crusader army and 7,000 of Abd al-Malik's Moroccans, leading the battle to be referred to as the Battle of Three Kings. King Sebastian perished leading a doomed charge, Abu Abdallah drowned attempting to cross the swollen Lucos River to escape, and the sickly Abd al-Malik succumbed to the exertion of a day's riding. His death was kept a secret by Ahmed al-Mansur until the battle had ended in victory, with the vast majority of the surviving crusaders being captured and sold either for ransom or into slavery. The battle was nothing short of a national crisis for Portugal, with the king and most of the nation's nobility slaughtered in a single day. In the succession conflicts that followed, a Castilian army would invade the nation, ousting claimants from Sebastian's House of Avis to bring Portugal into a dynastic union under the House of Habsburg. Yet while the Moroccan victory had been decisive and total, the Battle of Alcazar Kabir was also something of a defeat for the Ottoman Empire. Abd al-Malik had been a loyal Ottoman ally, but Ahmed al-Mansur, who succeeded him, would prove fiercely independent, resisting all attempts to force Morocco into subservience, whether by Portugal, Castile, or his former patrons, the Ottomans. In the coming years, he would oversee a brief golden age for Morocco, building great works across the nation and marching an army across the Sahara to conquer the great Songhai Empire of West Africa. It is difficult to summarize the Ottoman-Portuguese conflict 
especially in the light of the latter being annexed by Habsburg Spain. Given the massive discrepancy in size and resources between the two powers, Portugal's dogged defence is quite remarkable, facing down one of the world's greatest empires, surrounded by its allies and tributaries, the small Iberian kingdom had waged decades of unceasing warfare and scored decisive victories in many of the war's largest confrontations. But the accomplishments of the Ottomans were remarkable in their own right. When they had taken over from the Mamluks, the Portuguese had ruled unopposed in the Indian Ocean, with the Red Sea blockaded and the Egyptian spice trade all but strangled. Just a few decades later, the Ottomans controlled the dominant share of the Indian trade, while the Caliphate, a title that had been all but meaningless since the Mongol sack of Baghdad, was again seen as a source of prestige and authority for the Ottomans by Muslims across much of the Indian Ocean world. Though the Dutch and English would become dominant in the Indian Ocean in later centuries, at the expense of Portuguese and Ottomans alike, the legacy and prestige of these victories would be remarkably long-lasting. More than 300 years later, English officers serving with Indian soldiers in the First World War would report fears of mutiny, writing of the great respect their Muslim soldiers held for the Ottoman Sultan. More videos on the colonial conflicts are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.